This is part one of a three-part series on Dr. Wayne Grudem's Free Grace Theology, Five Ways It Diminishes the Gospel. First, I'll give my review of Dr. Grudem's book, and then in part two, I will review Bob Wilkin of the Grace Evangelical Society. I'll review Bob's response against Dr. Grudem in his Grudem Against Grace, as he has a point-by-point -point rebuttal of Grudem's book. And then in part three, I will review Free Grace Theology, five ways it magnifies the gospel, since it appears to be more of a positive statement of picturing free grace instead of a rebuttal against what Grudem has written. So first, let's go over the good. I want to start by thanking Dr. Grudem for taking the time to critique free grace theology in a scholarly and well-researched fashion. It is clear in both his writing and the bibliography of this book that Dr. Grudem took the time to read several free grace books before writing his own. I am accustomed to watching and reading reviews online regarding free grace, and it seems clear in almost every situation that the creator of the video or the writer of the article has not taken any time to read any material from free grace authors. And so I thank Dr. Grudem for taking the time in his diligent preparation. Also, I appreciated his tone. Dr. Grudem, as he pretty much always is, was respectful, kind, and understanding. While I don't think he always understood the beliefs of the free grace community, at the, on the other hand, I don't think he was purposefully building up straw men that he can easily tear down, and for the most part was trying to respond directly to free grace statements. I found his tone to be refreshing throughout. The best section in the book was chapter 2 on repentance, as he directly interacted with the writings of Charlie Bing and presented a strong case for repentance as not being a change of mind, but a turning from sin. For someone who is wrestling with how to understand repentance in the Bible, in the multiple contexts in which it appears, I appreciated Grudem's work and his interactions with the writing of Dr. Bing. And I think the book would have been even stronger if he was interacting as clearly with the writings of Free Grace authors throughout as he was in that particular section. Also, chapter one was very good on how the faith alone message of Free Grace is not the faith alone message of the Reformers. Now, the vast majority of the proponents of the Free Grace community would give a resounding amen to the overall point of this chapter. Chapter, as the Free Grace community believes that the Reformers' problem was that they did not go far enough in separating works from faith since they were just waking up from the long slumber of being under the leadership of Rome. Now, at this point, in order to stay near my normal review length, I'm just going to share my top three complaints for this book. First was on assurance. I don't believe any Christian should find the assurance of their salvation in their behavior. Instead, our assurance for our eternal destiny should rest upon the perfection of Christ's life, the covering of his blood from his death on the cross, and the power of his bodily resurrection, which lead us to the promise he makes to provide eternal life to those who believe in him. At the end of this book, Grudem writes, Born-again Christians can and should be able to have the assurance of eternal life, and that is one of the great blessings offered to us in the New Testament. But then Grudem writes about lesser and greater amounts of assurance that are based not on Christ, but on our works. And I see this as robbing Christians of the great blessing of the New Testament. Your assurance of your salvation, my assurance, should not rest in our behavior, but it should only rest in Jesus Christ. As the old hymn said, I need no other argument, I need no other plea, it is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. There is 100% assurance for those who believe in Jesus for eternal life. And there is no assurance 
for those who do not. There is no middle ground of lesser and greater assurance. Second, under emphasis on trust in the person of Christ. This whole chapter was just really weird for me. As someone who turned to free grace theology about three years ago from a view of soteriology that was largely formed by the writings of Wayne Grudem. Because one thing I have grown in my time in free grace is in my increase in my trust in the person of Christ. Free grace drives you and encourages you to place all of your faith in Jesus and none of it on what you have done as a result of Jesus' work. Grudem writes of representatives of the free grace movement who define faith only in terms of agreement with facts. Now, on the one hand, I would say Grudem is right. It is a mental assentment to the facts that saves. But he has his facts wrong. The facts are not confessing or agreeing with the historical facts that Jesus is God's son. Jesus died on a cross. Jesus rose from the dead. And if you assent to those facts, you're saved. No, the mental assent that is required is a belief that as a result of Jesus' person and works, he can offer you the promise of eternal life. He can offer you his own everlasting life. And if you believe in Jesus to fulfill his promises, you are saved. In the same way Abraham believed God could fulfill his promise regarding the descendants of Abraham, once Abraham believed God could fulfill his promise, boom, Abraham was declared righteous. It's not believing in facts about Jesus, but it is believing in Jesus to do what Jesus has promised he would do. And this really is just, it's, it's mental assent. It is assenting to Jesus' ability and his willingness to fulfill his own word, which is trusting in the person of Jesus Christ. Most people in the free grace community are fine with mental assent because what we're saying is when you believe in Jesus, it doesn't need to be heartfelt faith. It doesn't need to be committed faith. It doesn't need to be wholehearted faith. But God can take the, the smallest, the weakest faith in Christ and bring life to the believer. Because we aren't trusting in the quality of our faith, but we're trusting in the quality of our Savior. So I don't understand how free grace has an underemphasis on trusting in the person of Jesus. From my experience, it's the exact opposite. That's what free grace is all about. Third, Grudem said on multiple occasions that repentance and obedience is optional for the free grace believer. First, he had no quotations of a free grace teacher ever writing or saying that repentance is optional because it's not. Grudem makes a classic mistake when it comes to separating salvation from discipleship. Just because a work is not required for salvation does not then make it optional for believers because it is required for discipleship. You should never divide our faithfulness to God into two categories. Those things that are required for eternal life, those are required, you got to do them. But the other parts of your life that are for discipleship, those are optional for faithful living. No, we say that they're all required necessity. The things that bring eternal life, they're required in order to have eternal life. The things that we do to deepen our fellowship with Jesus Christ, they are required so we can have a deeper and fuller life with our Savior. As an example, my two daughters, who are 13 and 11, have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. I believe their profession of faith in Jesus is a genuine trust in him as a person to save them based on his promises. And I believe they're saved, and they're eternally secure. Yet I would never tell them, well, girls, 
Now since you've been saved by Jesus and your eternal place is secure, it doesn't matter who you marry. It's totally optional for you. You can marry a Christian or you can marry an unbeliever because walking in your Christian life is optional for you. It's not optional. Just because walking a faithful life is not required in order to receive salvation does not make it optional for the secure believer. In fact, I hear clear, consistent calls to obedience just as much, if not more, by free grace teachers, and they call for it not out of fear that if you don't do right, you might end up in hell, or if you don't do right, that means that you don't really believe, but it's a healthy response to the grace that's been given to you and motivated by eternal rewards. Now, I could go into more, but for time's sake, I'm going to leave my review here. I do believe every proponent of the free grace gospel should read Dr. Grudem's book. Allow your faith to be challenged. Look deeply into what others see as flaws and errors in your theology. It will only help to either strengthen you in what you already believe or correct things that are an error in your theology. And in a book that is kind, that is friendly, and well thought out, this is a great place to have your faith challenged and to be pushed back against to ensure that you really are believing in Jesus for salvation. So in spite of, or maybe even because of my disagreements with Dr. Grudem, I highly recommend his book, Free Grace Theology, Five Ways It Diminishes the Gospel. And if you've enjoyed this review and you want to stay connected to the wonderful world of Christian literature, I'd encourage you to subscribe to the Rev Reads YouTube channel.